Greetings and welcome everyone to another episode on Oral Pathology Tuesdays. Today we are again back with the fundamental series and we are going to continue with the second part of Tooth Pathology with Dr. Keat. Before we proceed, I have some very interesting and wonderful news. Among those is that uh, first and foremost, we have <clears throat> almost a trendsetter. Uh, our last week's uh, lecture is on its way. It was a discussion actually on its way to becoming the topmost uh, video. It's getting very close to being the most viewed video on the channel. Dr. Bhuvan, who was there talking with me last week, is also attending today. And I hope this video will go on. Of course, it's thanks to the fact that the Indian oral pathology fraternity is rather large. In fact, it's the largest in the world. But nonetheless, it's a very good thing. The, so that is one thing. If you have not seen it, you can still, of course, go and see it. It's on the channel. The next thing is, of course, talking about... Uh, sorry. <clears throat> about the many videos that we have. So among those is uh, the whole list of now nearly 200 videos and we have managed to put all of those on the website. So you can find it very easily on the website at uh, oralpathology360.com and the tab is uh, videos, very simply, or you can scan this. It's also there on the description. Uh, definitely make it a point to go and see because there's a whole lot of videos which I'm sure everyone has not seen as yet. So it will be great if you can go and see it just to have a look and let us know uh, which are the topics you want us to cover next? And, uh, okay, so, right. Sorry, a little complicated setting here going on. <laughs> right. Uh, last, uh, some days back, we announced that we have a new membership and which you can see a join button underneath right now also as you are watching. So this uh, membership is basically to support our activities going forward or rather additional activities what is going on will remain exactly the way it is all the archive of videos the weekly events everything will remain of the same quality and in the same way that they have been going on so far but we do want to add some things and for that it will be nice if you can support by becoming members and paying a small amount monthly will help uh, one of the main things we are starting is a video clinical pathological atlas of oral and maxillofacial uh, diseases. So that will be helped along if you can uh, support. If not, that's also fine. No worries. Just enjoy the videos and uh, just be there. It's uh, what matters. In the meanwhile, if you have not subscribed before, you can also please do that. Okay, let's bring Dr. Keat in. Hi, Keat. Welcome. Hi, Mandana. It's good to be with you again. Same here. It's great to have you. So, of course, <clears throat> we had a rather longer introduction last time. So this time I will just say that Professor Keat is from the University of Liverpool. He is mostly working on oral cancer, but this is his favorite topic too. And uh, we hope to hear more from him on this as well. Right. So with that, we will go on with your lecture. Okay. Well, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's good to have your company again. And we're going to uh, take some time to look at uh, another few topics in tooth pathology. For those of you who missed the first exciting episode, uh, we covered aspects of uh, tooth development, uh, not alterations in tooth number, shape, size, and so on. And then we started to have a look at the developmental disorders of the structure of teeth. And we had a look at amelogenesis uh, imperfecta as we finished. So as we start this time, we're really going to come and start with the inherited defects of dentine. And this is an area in which there has been, over the last few years, uh, a number of um, improvements in the classification and our understanding of the disease. The clinical feature, as you can see here, uh, not unexpected in terms of that opalescent uh, appearance of the teeth, slight orange-brown appearance. The enamel is lost very quickly. The teeth are then worn down, and this is a, a classic example of dentinogenesis imperfecta. So I'm sure you'd be very well aware of the Shields classification, which separated the inherited disorders of dentine into two main groups. There were those which were classically described as dentinogenesis imperfecta, and those which were 
as dentine dysplasia. And there were various subgroups of that, uh, the three subgroups of, of dentinogenesis imperfecta, as you can see here, and two of dentine dysplasia. Now, as time has gone on, and we have had sequencing technologies to be able to look at the underlying genetic basis of this, the limitations of this classification have become apparent. Um, we know that the background for those who have um, dentinogenesis imperfecta and a background of osteogenesis imperfecta is related to mutations in collagens A1 and A2, and that's still extant and still separate and stands. However, across the other groups of lesions, it has become increasingly apparent that mutations in dentine sialophosphoprotein, DSPP, are common across the group of lesions, and they go across the boundary of, of the phenotypic uh, descriptions that Shields had put in his classification. And so we know that uh, dentinogenesis type, uh, imperfecta type 1 uh, is separate. Type 2 and type 3 are both variants of uh, DSPP mutated dentine. And so also is dentine dysplasia type 2. And so this really then brings us to having to reorder the classification. And remember we spoke last time about changing the classifications away from phenotypic basis to them to a genetic basis. And this does bring a new classification of inherited abnormalities of dentine. So there are those related to osteogenesis imperfecta, some of which forms of OI have DI with it, some don't. Then there is what we would call now dentinogenesis imperfecta. And the defining feature of that is that there's a mutation in DSPP. And this includes a wide phenotype in terms of severity of the, uh, the appearance of the teeth, which we shall see. And then there is class, what was formerly dentine dysplasia type 1, which we're now just called dentine dysplasia, for which the genetic basis is unknown, although for a small number of these patients, a mutation in SMOC2 has been identified. So osteogenesis imperfecta, very well recognized in terms of the blue sclera, which are associated with that. Um, the teeth which are in, in dentinogenesis imperfecta, they tend to have a normal crown shape and size on eruption. The coloration, as I showed you in the clinical picture, is as you have seen, the enamel is lost and the soft dentine is worn away. Radiographically, they're quite abnormal in terms of the pulp and the root formation. The crowns may be slightly bulbous, but the roots tend to be short and spindly and the pulp chambers are very often obliterated. As you can see in the bite wing radiograph here, rather bulbous crowns. You see the enamel is present. The roots are short and stubby, and there is obliteration of the pulp chamber. The histology of these, although in many cases you can make the diagnosis of DI without having to resort to histology, there tends to be an absence of scalloping along the amylodentinal junction. But that is very important in the mechanical link between the enamel and the dentine. And part of that lack of scalloping reduces the mechanical retention, hence the enamel is easily lost. There tends to be a relatively normal layer of mantle dentine, although it is quite often in a normal circumstance, hypotubular. And then throughout the rest of the dentine, it is like that. They are hypotubular, the tubulars are irregular in their shape, in their size and in their contour. Uh, and the, uh, the cellular inclusions from the pulp, and when, when the pulp is shrinking down, there are small little remnants of pulp which are found there, and eventually you, you get pulp obliteration. And, and there are differences between the types, as I'm going to show you. Here is an incisor tooth. Again, it's an exfoliated incisor. Loss of the enamel, as you can see. And in this case, with the polarization of the light, you can see the orientation of the tubules. They're almost like branched trees, rather than running from the pulp to the amylodentinal junction. Here is the matched um, decalcified section. And again, you can see the other features that we had seen in the radiograph. Short root, obliteration of the pulp, and a rather patchy looking strange appearance to it. It's not an interglobular dentine pattern, but the overall structure and mineralization of the dentine is different. It is abnormal, uh, as you can see in the, uh, the decalcified section. So here is a, another example of a case with, with DI. And uh, you can see in this case that we do have all the teeth which are forming. It's a patient in mixed dentition. And there are lots of areas where the enamel has been lost, as you can see here, and uh, obliteration of the pulp, uh, even within the primary dentition. 
So here are some teeth from that very case. Again, very similar to the things we've seen before. Uh, rather abnormal. It's a higher power. You'll see it is hypotubular. Obliteration of the pulp. And in this case, the, the enamel is present on the surface. But again, you can see how abnormal the root formation is in this, uh, this uh, ground section. But here's an interesting case. And this is one that was sent to me as a consult case, a referral case, which is a... a, a, a a family which have a dentinogenesis imperfecta pedigree. And in fact, it's in the background of atypical osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, although that, uh, as far as I could tell, was not an established diagnosis. Primary teeth looked okay, but the teeth were widespread mobile, so there was obviously problems with the formation of the roots. And so this was the, um, the radiographs that I eventually managed to get for this case. And you can see the crowns of the teeth are the present, they're probably roughly normal size, but the root system is completely ghostly. Uh, there is almost no formation of hard tissue in the roots, even though the outline is there. And these are classically what has been described as shell teeth, or what in the Shields classification would have been called dentinogenesis imperfecta type 3, or the brandywine isolate, that's what it was initially described in. And this actually, you can see the effect. Here's the incisors, very similar appearance. The crown is there. There's very little distinction between enamel and dentine, as you can see. Uh, but the roots are ghostly, just outline. No real substance to the dentine formation in the root at all. Uh, the histology of one of these incisors, you can see that the root has almost collapsed in on itself, very difficult to take out intact. Uh, and the overall tubular structure of the dentine was as you would expect in dentinogenesis imperfecta. Although in the crown, as you can see here in the ground section, it looks as if the tubular structure is relatively regular in the initially formed dentine. And then there comes a point further down towards the root of where it is markedly abnormal. So we've got, a, we've got a variation in phenotype here. And so I called this dentinogenesis imperfecta and osteogenesis imperfecta. The clinical query came to me whether this was dentine dysplasia in osteogenesis imperfecta, but I think that this fits into this rather expanded phenotype of dentinogenesis imperfecta. And in this case, this patient is presumed to have osteogenesis imperfecta rather than DSPP associated dentinogenesis imperfecta. And these shell teeth um, were originally described way back in 1954. There's very little in the literature. Was originally parked, as I've indicated, uh, either as DI type 3 or as dentine dysplasia. Uh, and that is probably where it sits now in the classification. And so it demonstrates quite nicely that there is a wide phenotype, a variable expressivity of the trait in those who have these mutations. So moving on to dentine dysplasia, and I'm really only going to deal with what is classically known as dentine dysplasia type 1, which is described as rootless teeth. Now, not long after I moved to Sheffield, I received this case as a consult case from Glasgow, um, and I received this radiograph, and I received all of the teeth in a pod. As you can see, that there is really no root structure at all to these teeth, and that they were rapidly very mobile after eruption. So here we have one of these teeth. Again, you can see in the decalcified and the matched ground section that we have a crown structure, which in terms of this incisor, it is relatively normal. It has a, quite a large pulp chamber. Um, but you can see that the root formation is markedly abnormal. There is no elongation of the root. And in fact, the root seems to be enfolded at the base of the pulp chamber. So here is what this dentine such looks like. It's, it's not really tubular at all. It has lots of little inclusions in it, as you can see, and it has this overall rather nodular appearance to it, which is much more apparent on a ground section. So here it is on the ground section, and you can see these nodules of dentine here in that root, which really has not formed very well at all. This is another case of very similar, um, although uh, there is almost a there's complete obliteration of the pulp in this case um, and almost no root formation. Again, there is variable expressivity in dentine dysplasia, which in some cases you will get complete lack of roots 
whereas in cases like this, there is a rudimentary form of the root. And again, you can see the overall histology within this decalcified section, where the dentine from about mid-crown apically is this nodular appearance to it, um, and which that is further seen on a ground section, um, which it's supposed to look like this. Now, we know that pathologists tend to be quite expressive in the way that they take analogies from various things and, and how they illustrate things, but the, the overall appearance of this uh, and the, the nodules of, of poorly formed dentine are supposed to look like waters, water flowing across boulders. I'll leave you to judge whether you think that's a good analogy or not. So that's the acquired disorder, the inherited disorders of dentine. I'm going to come back. I'll mention briefly cementum later on in relation to aspects of systemic disease and uh, tooth formation. But we now come to a completely different section, which is the acquired disorders of structure. And of course, you will not be surprised that this is dominated by one condition, dental caries. I'm going to have a quick look through that. I don't spend a lot of time on it, but just a quick reprise of the pathology of dental caries, which I think in a lot of circumstances is perhaps not taught quite as thoroughly as it once was. Then there are the acquired hypoplasias, which we'll see that there are ones which are related to particular uh, temporal relationship with the development of the teeth, the so-called chronological hypoplasias, and also turnus teeth, and we'll talk a little bit about hypersementosis. So what about dental caries? Well, here is enamel caries, the classic white spot lesion, with this conical lesion, which is extending with its base at the surface, and with the apex of that extending towards the amelodentinal junction. It has a number of zones in that, that you can see in the ground section. These are optical phenomena, you may remember, in terms of how the tissue sections are, are processed and how they are then mounted, uh, and whether the light is being able to be transmitted or whether it is being refracted when it shines through the section. And so there is the translucent zone around the leading edge, then the dark zone, the body, and the surface zone. And the surface zone is that interface with the oral environment, the body will gradually, over a period of time as the lesion progresses, lose mineral, and there will come a point where it cannot support itself and it will cavitate. So that's the diagram with the zones, as you can see here, um, in diagrammatic form uh, for your reference. But then we move into the lesion after it has cavitated, and this, as you can see, is a rather large occlusal carious lesion in a molar tooth with the cavity at the top here, the breach in the enamel, and you can see some of the features of enamel caries in each side of that cavity. But then you can also see the uh, effects within dentine with uh, the very poorly, this, this very yellow stain denatured dentine. This will be very soft indeed clinically. And then areas which have gradually further round that been further demineralized, but round surrounding all of that uh, lesion is uh, the the formation of dead tracts, of sclerotic dentine, and then at the pulp interface, the uh, development of tertiary dentine as the pulp attempts to defend itself from the advancing carious lesion. So here we have uh, this uh, cavity, if you like, in diagrammatic form again, the zones that you'll be very well aware of, the zones of destruction and penetration where the dentine is very much demineralized. There are bacteria present in the tubules. Clinically, it's very soft. Beyond that, an area of demineralization where uh, it will not be quite as soft, but it's certainly lost some of the mineral, but is sterile. It is affected dentine rather than infected. And then round the edge of that, to a variable extent, there will be the sclerotic zone where the tubules are becoming uh, um, filled in with mineralized material and again in an attempt to wall off the advancing carious lesion. And then, as I indicated in the previous histological section, the formation of dead tracts and tertiary dentine. So what about the variations in tooth structure which are acquired? Um, enamel hypoplasias are, generally speaking, relatively common for a number of different reasons. Now, in order to be this in terms of an acquired um, lesion, it has got to not be uh, inherited, and there has then a, a defect 
either at some, at some point in the formation of the enamel, matrix formation or mineralization. And depending on the timing of it or the point where the insult is uh, on the tooth, this can occur in relation to a single tooth, a localized form, for example, a Turner tooth, and a single infected tooth related to that, or several teeth when it is generalized. Uh, in general, the dentine is also affected, but the defects are not so visible clinically for various obvious reasons. So here is the single localized tooth. Again, you'd be very aware of this whole idea of a tooth which has uh, been infected or uh, the, the kid that falls out the door on the front the first day of school and bashes their tooth and uh, so it then may intrude the primary tooth and it will affect the developing uh, secondary tooth underneath that uh, and soften and somehow there is damage to the underlying developing tooth germ and when that erupts you can see the effects of that and in this case there is areas where the enamel has been lost uh, due to whatever the trauma has been. Generalized or chronological hypoplasia tends to not be related to a local effect, but rather to a systemic effect on tooth formation. And so what you'll get is a matching appearance and teeth which are forming at the same time as the insult has come. Um, and so uh, in most of them, let me say about two thirds of cases, that this episode occurs in the first year of life. So this is very much associated with neonatal health it can affect teeth for first molars and sizes and canines and can result from a whole variety of systemic insults. And you can see in the picture here that we have an effect that's a band across the incisors here uh, at that particular time, where obviously the canines are, 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 are less well developed at that point. So what about the insults? Well, they could be prenatal and that will, again, the timing primarily affect the primary dentition so congenital syndromes, maternal rubella infection, and so on. Then there are those which occur round about the time of birth. And so you'll find that, for example, extreme prematurity, rhesus incompatibility, uh, and other some of them related to infections and so on. Again, you will have that consistent site of a band which will affect the development of the teeth. Postnatally, fluorosis. Uh, you get hypoplasia and brown staining. And even as we'll show later, and I'm going to show an example of this later in terms of discoloration of teeth, tetracyclines uh, as well can result in hypoplasia. And that will be particularly related to the timing of the, uh, the administration of uh, tetracyclines. So the fluorosis may well be over a longer period of time. And then childhood fevers, measles, chickenpox can also have a record imprinted on the teeth. And then lastly, this rather enigmatic condition known as molar incisor hypomineralization, which is probably some part of uh, the generalized enamel hypoplasia, given the fact that it is very often related to the incisors and the first molar teeth, uh, with a rather pronounced chronological pattern. So here's our chronological hypoplasia. Initially, the formation of this tooth, this incisal edge, has been markedly hypoplastic. And then the insult, whatever it is, has resolved and more normal tooth formation with a more uh, regular thickness of enamel has then started again. Here's an example of fluorosis with the opacification of the enamel and the, the breakdown and the pitting uh, with the, with the post-eruptive breakdown. What about hypercementosis? Now we haven't really talked very much about cementum at all. And certainly, um, hypercementosis, that is an excessive amount of cementum being formed, uh, is very common. And cementum is gradually laid down over the life of a teeth. So there's a certain extent to which some amount of hypercementosis is merely an age-related phenomenon. It can be present due to a number of reactive phenomena. Um, we know that it occurs and teeth which do not erupt and come into full function in the occlusion. So unerupted teeth, uh, very often if you are to extract uh, a lower third molar tooth, you'll find that even though it has never come into function, it can have a thick layer of cementum on the surface. In chronic inflammation, so for example, in a periapical granuloma, which is long-standing, again, you may find elements of hypercementosis, 
And that may be due to the fact that as the granuloma expands, that the overall um, support for the tooth is being reduced. So there's hypersemantosis is in relation to that. Similarly, also in periodontitis, when there is loss of support of the teeth in the periodontal ligament, and uh, it's assumed that some amount of hypersemantosis is in an attempt to stabilize the teeth in the periodontal ligament. Classically, we also see hypersemantosis in Paget's disease, a disease that certainly in the UK we see incredibly rarely now, not very much part of our diagnostic uh, practice at all. Uh, a rather enigmatic disease of bone turnover, perhaps related to childhood infection. It's rather unclear what the etiology of it is. But one of the other features that happens in this is there is marked hypersemantosis. And then there are those which are idiopathic, which essentially means we don't have a clue. So here's hypersemantosis, the one on the left here, with that included the patchy cotton wool appearance in the bone is uh, hypersemantosis, which has occurred in Paget's disease. And then you can see in the right hand figure here that there is marked loss of support around these teeth. And that has probably at least contributed to the hypersemantosis that we see on all of the teeth in this periapical radiograph. Histologically, it is largely as you would expect. It is an overgrowth of cellular cementum with cementocytes embedded within the substance of the cementum. Very often other organic inclusions as well, as you can see here. And as also you can see in the higher power figure, it is subject to turnover. So you will get marked reversal lines present in a lot of cases of hypersemantosis. One of the consequences of hypersemantosis is ankylosis and fusion. We talked a little bit, I mentioned concrescence when we talked about the twinning of teeth when we're talking about the developmental disorders, but um, concrescence, which is the fusion at the cementum level, is it, it, not a developmental disorder, essentially. It's, it's an acquired disorder because the teeth are so close together. And ankylosis, as you can see in this case, where both of these molar teeth have become fused to the bone of the alveolus, the periodontal ligament space is gone. And so that makes for a very interesting uh, afternoon, evening, perhaps a, a prolonged surgical uh, period trying to get a tooth like this out. This is the nightmare. And of course, you know exactly when this happens. It always happens on a Friday afternoon when you have other things planned uh, for the weekend. Much more common, for example, in a periapical granuloma or in a radicular cyst type appearance, when you get the roots on occasion, when you do get them extracted, you will find little nodules of reactive hypersemantosis similar to this. What about other conditions? And these are ones which are much less well understood. Regional odontodysplasia, I'm going to talk about in some detail. Segmental odontomaxillary dysplasia, which I'll mention briefly, is a rather enigmatic condition. And is actually now in the WHO classification of 2022-23 found its way into the overall grouping of fibrosis lesions of the jaws. So regional odontodysplasia has been known about for a number of years, has a lot of different cis, um, synonyms like ghost teeth and so on. And so what you get is an, a non-inherited disturbance of all of the hard tissues, in fact, all of the tissues of the tooth, it's not just the hard tissues. Most common uh, in maxillary anteriors, but uh, also in my experience, it's relatively common also in the premolar areas. And there's a lot that has been said about etiology, but nobody really knows. I've seen examples where it is extended beyond just a segment. So that means it's not really regional. Uh, and in some cases, we had one case that I remember particularly spectacular one that extended across the midline, but that is incredibly rare. So this is the sort of appearance that you might get, and this is obviously in, uh, in uh, sort of premolar canine incisor area. Teeth missing in the arch, overall ghostly outlines of the developing teeth forms, but no real good tooth formation or hard tissue formation to be seen. And this is a, a, an example here of a, a case that I had again as a referral case. You can see that in this segment, this is in the premolar segment, that there are teeth that are missing, but also that the structures that are there 
have been attempting to erupt into the mouth. And because they are so poorly formed, they rapidly become infected and symptomatic. And this was the radiograph related to that case I've just shown you. And you can see again in the premolar quadrant here that there are ghostly outlines of teeth. Some of them have almost come up to occlusion, so they've been trying to erupt. And probably the molar tooth at the back here is also similarly affected. So it is a whole region of that posterior segment of the left side of the maxilla. And this is the nicest example of an intact regional odontic dysplasia tooth that I've ever had. Um, and you can see this has been extracted with uh, an amount of soft tissue. Here's the occlusal surface. There is the shell outline of a tooth here. Uh, a pulp chamber of sorts, which is containing only necrotic material, and in fact there is periapical pathology related to the very rudimentary root system that is formed in association with this tooth. These are the structures that you will find. First of all, instead of an, a, a regular enamel layer, you have a very irregular globular attempt at making enamel. And some people have referred to these blobs of enamel matrix as enamel conglomerates. And they're very common across the occlusal surface of these teeth and can also be scattered in the connective tissue around the crown of the teeth. And if you see this type of material in a small biopsy uh, adjacent to a tooth, uh, it's very suggestive of regional odontic dysplasia. The dentine, as you can see here, is tubular to an extent, but it's hypotubular and is very poorly mineralized. You can see the extensive interglobular dentine pattern with even individual calcospherites still present. And then a pulp chamber here doesn't really have a well-formed odontoblast layer. Um, and in this case, the pulp seems to be vital. Here we have um, the uh, enamel conglomerates and these fragments of very poorly formed enamel extending off into the connective tissue surrounding the crown of the tooth. This was one of the deeper situated ghostly teeth. So it's not got the effects of the uh, inflammation and infection which is associated with it. And again, you can see thin layer of, of enamel, then dentine, primitive pulp with pulp stones very often present uh, and the connective tissue surrounding that. Segmental odontodysplasia, odontomaxillary dysplasia, uh, I've only seen a couple of cases of that. We had one relatively recently, again, on our, on our consult case, uh, a, a rare developmental disorder, and I think clinically very often um, confused with regional odontodysplasia. It tends to affect, as you, the name would, you can imagine, a posterior maxillary segment, very often involving the premolar, and absence of the second premolar is particularly common. But not only does it affect the teeth, it affects the bone as well. And the abnormal growth and maturation of the bone, abnormal trabecular structure um, on the radiographs, it's a bit subtle, very difficult to, to actually see that in isolation without having something to compare it to. Um, and there is also hyperplasia of the gingiva. And it's something that you're not going to make a diagnosis of on histology. It is something to bear in mind when you have this particular constellation of clinical appearances that, that with the radiology that will allow you to make the diagnosis of, of SOMD. Moving on in this acquired uh, region of, of conditions, we then have to consider uh, the teeth and systemic disease. Now, some of these, of course, you say, well, we've already dealt with some of them in relation to chronological hyperplasia, and, and that is very true. But the list of syndromes which may well, well affect the teeth, I'm not talking about developmental abnormalities of teeth syndromes, I'm talking about general syndromes which relate to systemic health, which have an effect on the teeth. There are two particular conditions which are worth talking about. So the first of these is variably called hypophosphatemia or vitamin D resistant rickets. Mutation has now been established in a particular gene, although they are most commonly in, in the, the PHEX gene, but others have been described. And they tend to present with a particular clinical appearance that the patients will present with spontaneous abscesses in the teeth, apparently in an incredibly low caries background. And I've got some examples of that. And then as I said, it would return to cementum, hypophosphatasia, which is mutated alkaline phosphatase, which overall affects the formation of bone. And because bone and cementum are very similar in their structure, 
you tend to get marked hypocementosis, which means that the teeth are not well anchored in the periodontal ligament, resulting in mobility and exfoliation of teeth. So this is an example of a patient with vitamin D resistant rickets. And you can see the appearance of that. We've got a patient, and maybe there's a little bit of caries around, but generally speaking, we've got this odd appearance of a, a patient who probably doesn't have a particularly high caries rate, but seems to have had a lot of endodontics, which might raise a few alarm bells. This is another example here. And you can see that this is also associated with marked torodontism, that there is a, a, a very large increase in the size of the pulp chamber. And if you have a look at the pulp horns, they look as if they are really long and they're extending up towards the amelodontinal junction. And that is the key feature that you may be able to see to some extent in this case, as in this case in radiology, but you will see it if you have a look at the teeth in histology. And these are the appearances that you tend to get. So the overall enamel is, is relatively normal in, in, in shape and the amount of that. But the dentine, there are some classic appearances. The first thing of note is very pronounced interglobular dentine, very prominent. And if you get extensive interglobular dentine throughout a large proportion of the tooth, that's the first thing that should come into your mind in terms of a differential diagnosis. The other thing that tends to happen are there are long pulp horns and clefts which extend from the tip of the pulp horn towards the amelodontinal junction. Now, if that's extending up towards an occlusal surface and the enamel at the base of the, the, the uh, occlusal surface pits and fissures is not very thick, that's going to allow easy ingress of bacteria into the pulp, hence the early necrosis on the background on a very low caries rate. So here's our classic interglobular dentine, almost pathognomic. You should really be rethinking this as a diagnosis if you see it. Moving on to other subjects now, just um, very briefly as we carry on, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on discoloration of teeth. There's some interesting uh, things in this. Most of the discoloration that we get of teeth are, are extrinsic, but there are some interesting intrinsic patterns as well. Variation in tooth color, as we know, is part of the normal panoply of life. We have, you could set up a lot of patients and you would have a marked variation in the color of teeth. And it's due to tooth thickness, structure, um, circulating substances in the blood, incorporation of pulp, exogenous agents, a lot of stains, coffee, wine, foodstuffs, medications, etc. So there's a large variation in tooth color, as we know. But there are common areas where you get the separation of extrinsic and intrinsic. So extrinsic food and beverages, black teeth from bacteria uh, and chlorhexidine, which tends to allow and precipitate on teeth. But the intrinsic ones uh, are the ones which are inherently more interesting. Fluorosis and tetracycline, we've mentioned. Um, fluorosis, which affects the overall structure of the mineralization. Tetracycline, which is incorporated as it's a chelating agent into the developing hard tissues. Restorations. Uh, inherited causes and so on. And then the features of pulp death, when pulp has died, has undergone some level of autolysis and there are pigments produced as part of that, which leach into the dentine particularly and result in discoloration. So here are some of our examples. Here's tetracycline staining and such uh, as its relation to the temporal aspects of when you were given the medication that if you have a look at the teeth, you can work out the timing of that, how many courses there have been and so on. And it will fluoresce under ultraviolet light, as you can see in this ground section here, that uh, each of the course of tetracycline, and there's been a lot of them, um, is recorded in the dentine. Porphyria is an inherited abnormality. Um, it is a multi-system disorder. It's an inherited abnormality of heme and porphyrin metabolism. Uh, this patients tend to have an extensive relapsing disease pattern um, with a lot of neurological symptoms and so on. But the uh, one of the side effects of that is that with the inability to metabolize heme and porphyrins properly is that they get deposited in the teeth. And in this case, it gives the teeth an overall pink or sometimes a rather darker hue to them 
Uh, and again, if you view that under uh, polarized and, uh, and at light, you can see uh, the fluorescence that you get from that. Non-vital teeth we're very familiar with as dentists in terms of the discoloration from uh, the uh, breakdown products of the pulp. And that's the, the background in terms of uh, the various techniques to be able to do bleaching of these teeth after appropriate endodontics. And here's a few examples of our uh, exogenous stains, various bacterial ones, medication. Uh, patients do strange things, as you're very well aware, in terms of medications that should be swallowed, but they chew and so on. And uh, for example, if they're taking iron supplementation, that will give their teeth uh, an incredible amount of discoloration. Um, and you need to try and get to the bottom of that uh, if you can. Another um, condition which I've come across with some amount of frequency, largely because I have an interest in tooth pathology, is pathological resorption. We know that the body has very well-developed methods for resorbing teeth. It needs them to, in order to be able to remove the roots of the primary dentition to allow the secondary dentition to erupt. But these um, processes do seem in some circumstances to be abnormally switched on. And this as a case you can see here, and if you're eagle-eyed, and although this is an OPG, it's maybe not the best example of it, which I'll show you other radiographs in a minute. If you have a look at the maxillary canines and premolar teeth, they look as if something's taken a bite out of them. And as you can see, this is a, this is a relatively young man, and he had a completely pristine dentition. Never had any operative dentistry. And he has teeth essentially as you can see, examples of it on the molars here, which he eventually needed a clearance in his upper arch. And this was one of the teeth, it was one of the premolar teeth. And you can see again, it just looks as if somebody has come at, centered around the melocemental junction and taken a bite out of the tooth. Pulp is vital, the structure of the dentine is relatively normal. And so something has triggered the onset of resorption within that point at the, um, the, the superficial part of the periodontal ligament. Higher power, you can see the resorption, lacunae and so on, fragments of tissue in the pulp chamber, but the pulp is, is, is completely vital. And so this is a, a relatively well described pattern of cervical resorption. Very often multiple teeth in the maxilla, the teeth are vital, there's no indication that there's anything inflammatory at all here, and it is an external resorption. It's not internal resorption, and it results in pulp exposure and then symptomatology from that. But no, certainly not, at least initially, in the genesis and the pathogenesis of, of the condition, there is no inflammation. And as it was, we, we had a case um, of a lady two weeks later with essentially exactly the same. And again, you can see this spectacular external resorption centered around the melocemental junction um, with the, uh, the pulp, uh, particularly in, in this premolar tooth here, being extensively involved. So what causes this? Well, nobody really knows. <clears throat> there has been suggestions that the configuration of the enamel in the cementum at the cemento and the enamel junction might be the issue. Is there a gap? Is there a significant exposure of dentine with a gap between the, the enamel and the cementum? Does that allow for the set off of the pathological resource? Nobody really knows. In some cases, it's been uh, linked to orthodontic treatment, particularly if there has been rapid movement of teeth and other trauma. But the list, as you can see there, is so long. And when you get a list of uh, things that are so probably none of them are specifically involved with this. It's all but certainly multifactorial. Whatever the result is, osteoclast or dentinoclasts are activated and the resorption of the, the roots proceeds, as you can see. Often it doesn't involve the pulps, so the pulps can be vital, but in the cases you have seen, the one that I showed you, um, the pulp is very definitely involved. So here in a, in a very similar type, and this is another interesting case. In this case, after many, many years, is still ongoing. It was an eight-year-old male who presented um, with sequential abscesses and primary molar teeth with no caries. You know, 
you know, there's a whole lot of uh, literature associated with this. And um, we thought initially he had vitamin D resistant rickets, and that would fit with the clinical picture. But something was not quite right about um, the teeth and the way that they were presenting. And um, these were some of his bite wings. And you can see a rather odd appearance in this. And this looks as if there's almost like a, a shell forming within the pulp chambers of these primary molar teeth. And the severity of that allowed us to predict which tooth was going to become symptomatic late next. And it did work out so in terms of exactly the sequence that we had predicted. So this was one of the teeth, as you can see here, uh, at the primary molar tooth, a large cleft up to the surface here, again, making us think of vitamin D resistant rickets, but not really interglobular dentine. The pulp is inflamed, it has an abscess in it, and has the shell of reparative type dentine. So it's not tubular dentine, it's that more osteodentine appearance with cells incorporated into it, which is very often uh, comes along with part of the resorptive process. Um, there's also appearances on, on the roots uh, and particularly in relation to the furcation. And this was a real puzzle to us. Here's a little higher power of the shell within the tooth pulp. It's got an abscess, as he indicated. And here is our tubular dentine. It's a, li a little bit of an interglobular dentine pattern. Um, and But this osteodentine repair here. And so given the fact that it had some features suggestive of vitamin D resistant rickets, we sent him away to a metabolic bone specialist and he came back with a completely clean bill of health. Nothing at all. Here's our cleft, which was perhaps the most suggestive thing. And other inclusions of uh, pulp tissue with an inflammation uh, and, and the reparative dentine that we saw. So this was a combination of massive internal as well as external resorption involving the furcation of all of these teeth and clefts and interglobular dentine. And we uh, had this differential diagnosis, as you can see here, um, which we discussed at some length with um, various dental pathology experts in pathology and pediatric dentistry uh, up and down the country and eventually we came to the idea that we really couldn't pigeonhole this and this was probably just a very unusual uh, idiopathic internal resorption and, and we did we did publish this the medical um, giving a, a clean bill of health so this was published uh, back uh, about it was about over 10 years ago uh, and we discussed what we thought um, was the etiology of this but of course there are features in this tooth which are not entirely explained uh, by this as a diagnosis Interestingly enough, they put um, uh, onlays on his first permanent molars to hopefully avoid this happening, and everything was fine until about 2018, when at that point he developed exactly the same thing in his, in his adult molar teeth. So there's something going on here that we really do not understand, and that's what makes teeth pathology just so fascinating. So that's all I have for you. It's been a whistle-stop tour through a number of different things that I've found particularly interesting and cases that I have had over the years. Uh, and I hope that you have found uh, these two sessions interesting. Um, it's not a, a huge part of my diagnostic life now, but it's a really interesting part of it. So thank you very much, Mandana, for um, inviting me to do these. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Right, so that was an absolutely amazing presentation as one has come to expect from Professor Keat. But now please put in your questions. Uh, we do have one question which we will get to right away. <coughs> yes, I must say it, it was uh, both the lectures and those histopathology, the demineralized sections were excellent because normally these fall apart. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, some of these have come, uh, I've had them for many years, and they've come from a background of very experienced oral pathology histotechnicians. And people with that experience in terms of histology for doing teeth are so rare now, and, and we struggle with that. Um, and the skills to be able to do ground sections are, are virtually disappearing. Uh, certainly our biomolecular scientists, as they're taught in the histopathology lab, are not taught to do any um, uh, mineralized bone uh, work at all. So it is a skill that is disappearing, and that's really very, um, very sad to see. 
true. Okay, let's take some questions. Professor Rondanelli has external resorption is also associated with tumors as odontogenic fibroma and amyloid or amyloid variant. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very true. There are a number of things which obviously I didn't discuss in terms of external resorption. We know what happens even in times with some very straightforward pathology. You get external resorption on occasion associated with radicular cysts. And it's just, I think, in various circumstances, the, the cytokine mix is sufficient to stimulate osteoclastogenesis and you then begin to get resorption of teeth. Particularly, we know that in some odontogenic tumors like odontogenic fibroma, amyloblastoma, that you will get resorption of the roots, and even in cases of giant cell granuloma, which perhaps is biologically not that unsurprising, that we see that as well. Right, yes. Okay. We have a lot of great presentations going on, right, from Professor Rondinelli to Mark yes, thank, th thank you to all. And I'll put an appeal to everybody to <coughs> keep aside their good tooth cases so that I can come knocking at some days when I put together my book. I can come to put out a plea for people to, to send me their good cases so we get good examples of all of these. Yes, in case everyone missed that, that was an announcement that he is planning to do a book. Right yeah, I, I have a plan, yes. I have, I, and it's no more than a plan at the moment, as you know, Mandana, to do a pathology of the Jaws textbook at some point over the next few years. So that, that's that's in the grand plan. Yes, but it, it's, I mean, your collection is amazing. and uh, yeah. so, really so there's a question here about how to differentiate right. between hypercementosis and cementoblastoma. Um, I think there are a number of different things which come into play there. Um, Cementoblastomas uh, are, tend to be very focal lesions on a single tooth. So if you see, for example, something that looks like you have expansion of cementum that is affecting more than one tooth, it's very unlikely to be a cementoblastoma. So that you get from the clinical and the radiographic appearance. But histologically, they're quite different as well. And for hypercementosis, it tends to be laid down in sequential lamellar structures. So you'll be able to see it's being laid down sequentially over a period of time. Whereas with the neoplastic formation of cementum, it tends to be much more like an osteoblastoma where it's a concentric expansion. And instead of being laid down in layers, it radiates out. And you remember the pictures that you'll have seen of cementoblastoma with these cellular rays and these rather plump, slightly atypical looking cells at the periphery of cementoblastoma. Uh, and so overall, the, the, the structure of it histologically tends to be quite different from hypercementosis. Um, but in many cases, you'll be able to make that distinction from clinical and radiographic appearance alone. Yes. Very good answer. And very complete. <clears throat> okay. Have we missed anything? Not really. We do have an audience from around the world, of course, from India, from Africa, from uh, Central America, from South America. Oh, we've got, got another question here. Um, staining secondary to liver disease, I don't have any experience of that. Uh, I mean, I guess in particular, that, that's something that will happen in a number of different circumstances. You know, in development, where you have uh, children who have uh, neonatal jaundice and so on, when there's a lot of circulating um, liver um, pigmented proteins. Um, but I have never seen that. And I guess that reflects the fact that I probably don't, other than pediatric cases that get sent to me for consult, I don't do very much pediatric pathology. So I'm, I'm not getting very much from, from our pediatric hospitals. Um, so I, I, I uh, Dr. Said, I'm, I'm afraid I can't, I can't give you much more of an answer than that. Right. So any more questions? Yeah, it was interesting for me that you included dental caries. It's a thing that always gets forgotten, and I, and I, 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 you know, when I was teaching this for our master's course in Sheffield, I, I would not prompt it. I would just say to somebody, I would like you to do me an outline of, of the acquired disorders, and they, all, they almost all forgot caries, and I said, come on, you're dentists. How, how can you forget caries, you know? Yeah, it's uh, just, we just, I think we just give it a very specific space by itself, and we forget yeah. to include it yeah. among the rest. Okay, sorry, something has happened to my... Okay. Is there a question? No. Okay. I 
I think that's it. Of course, so lots of thank yous and marvelous yeah. lecture, yeah. which um, and thank you everyone for listening. I think that's about it. You know, one of the photos I really liked was the the apple core was perfectly seen in the second X-ray you showed. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that yeah. that was yeah. Yeah. quite something. Okay, right. I think uh, we haven't got any more. Okay, I'll just share next week's program till. and give everybody a minute to type in in case because they are lagging a little behind us. So, right, so next week we are going to have a round table on patient safety in diagnostics. That is right from the clinical part, that is pre-analytical stage to imaging and lab procedures. This is again a topic that's not really taught, touched upon much, but I hope you will join us also at the same time. We already have two experts, but If you or someone you know is an expert in this topic, please get in touch with me and we would like to have more people on that panel. So as always, of course, it is on a Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. India. And uh, I do hope you will be with us. Okay. Right. So is there a new comment? Oh, not really. Okay. I think thank, um, thank you very much Madonna for having me done. for these yes. sessions. Thank you. Thank you and I hope you will not wait for another year to come back. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful having you with us Kate. Okay. Everybody see you next week and uh, have a wonderful time. Thank you for joining us today. See you. Thank you.